Welcome to physics. It is time to ponder lenses. So we've built kind of the background on refraction, gotten an idea of how light bends based on index refraction, calculated angles with Snell's law. Now, I want you to think about a lens, whether that be in eyeglasses or any time you have seen a lens. We want to define a lens, but we want to define it in terms of the characteristics of what it is. So think about the shape, think about what makes a lens a lens. If a substance is going to behave as a lens, first of all, it's going to have to be transparent. The fishbowl over on the side with the cat behind it. The fishbowl and the water inside are transparent. But not only are they transparent, but the sides are also curved and by the sides I'm referring to the front and the back. Any lens, if you think of feeling a pair of eyeglasses, it's not just a flat piece of glass. If it was, it would be a window, but it has curvature to it. So a lens is anything that's transparent and has sides that are curved, but there's a little bit more to it. It also has to vary in thickness when you're moving from the front to the back. So it can't be the same thickness, otherwise it would be just like a window. It has to have places that are narrow, places that are wider. So in general, we define a lens as anything that is transparent, that has sides that are curved, and that varies in thickness. So traditional lenses are made of glass, but a lot of other things also behave as lenses. Welcome back to the physics classroom. It's a little bit quiet here these days, but we're gonna ponder a couple demonstrations on refraction. Let me explain what I'm gonna do and then I'll turn the lights off. So what I have set up here is basically a box that's emitting light and it will emit rays of light that go across this sheet of paper that you'll be able to see when the lights are turned off. Okay, I'm going to take several different pieces of glass and put them here between the rays and the paper so you can see what the shapes are doing to the rays of light. So I've got a big rectangle. I've got a semicircle. I've got a shape that is thicker in the middle and thinner towards the outer edges. Nope, not gonna set that one up, I'll set that one down. I've got a shape that is thin in the middle and thicker towards the outer edges. And then I have some various and assorted different smaller shapes. And basically what we're trying to deduce is what happens when light goes through these how does it affect the direction of the light so that then we can work towards an understanding of lenses and what lenses are and what they do and why. So now hopefully you can see those rays of light traveling across the sheet of paper. Right now I have nothing between the ray box and the screen. If I run my fingers across there, you can see how it interrupts the light. So now what I'm gonna do is gonna take the rectangle um, and put it in front of the light. Notice the direction of the rays there versus here. When you have this rectangular shape, okay, uh, the direction of the rays of light really don't change. They get interrupted a little bit, but they're traveling essentially in the same direction without the block as with the block. If I now switch over to the semicircle of glass, when I bring the semicircle in, notice what happens to those rays of light. They go from being reasonably parallel to each other to coming down to a single point. That single point that the rays of light come down to would be known as the focal point. So we have a shape that is thin at the top, thick in the middle, and thinner at the bottom, and it's causing those rays of light to come together to a single point. If I take another shape, 
that is wider in the middle and narrow at the outer edges. Notice it also causes the rays to come together. The focal length would be a lot longer on this one than it was on the other one, but it still causes the rays to come together. If I take the circle of glass and put it in front of here, notice what happens for the circle of glass. You get the rays coming together, but they come together extremely quick, really close to where the circle of glass is. This would be an object of a very short focal length. Now let me change over to something that is narrow in the middle and wider at the outer edges. Notice what it does to the rays of light, causes them to spread out. They're originally parallel, and now those rays of light get wider apart. Now I'm gonna to switch to another shape that is narrow in the middle and wide towards the outer edges. When I bring it in here, notice what it does to our rays. The rays start parallel, and then the rays spread apart significantly. So in summary, if you have a shape that is wider in the middle and narrow towards the outer edges, it will cause those rays of light to come together. If you have a shape that is narrow in the middle and wider at the outer edges, it causes those rays to spread apart or diverge. That's how we're going to classify lenses by where they are thickest based on what they do to the light. Based on the demonstration, we can now classify the different shapes of lenses as converging or diverging. In the demonstration, we saw that light traveling through a lens that was thicker in the middle caused that light to come down to a single point. That's what converging means. So then we call these lenses that are thicker in the middle converging lenses. Conversely, we saw the lenses that were thin in the middle, the, sh the glass shapes that were thinner in the middle and thicker on the outer edges to cause the rays to spread apart. So lenses that have that thick part out towards the outer edges, we call diverging lenses. Now, introducing a little bit of terminology, on your converging lens shape, we saw in the demonstration that the rays of light passed through the lens and they came down to a more central point. That central point where those rays converge to is going to be the focal point. The focal point of the lens is the point where parallel rays converge to. For a diverging lens, those parallel rays went through the lens and they went apart. Well, as they went apart, if we can follow those rays back, like your eyes would, those rays would have appeared to have initiated from a single location, and that would be the focal point of that diverging lens. So for a diverging lens, it is the point where parallel rays appear to originate from. Now, let's think a little bit in terms of what causes the light to do that. So if we draw a shape that is thicker in the middle and thin towards the outer edges. So imagine this to be round and I'm just showing you a cross section. What we observed when light went through there, as light got to the lens and after it came out the other side, it went inward. If I draw another ray here, light went through and it refracted out the other side and came to a single point. Now, let, get, let me give you an analogy. Here is our shape of our lens again, but use your imagination for a minute. Imagine that you are out in a field and in this field, no social distancing, you're with a bunch of friends, so I'm gonna draw you and a bunch of friends. That's the top of your head. 
there's your friend, there's your friend, another friend, another friend, another friend, etc. And you're all holding hands. I'm glad you have a good imagination. And not only are you holding hands, but you are running this way in the open field. Now, as you run that way, you approach a very large mud puddle. Now, this mud puddle has kind of an odd shape to it, but it's very muddy, several inches deep in terms of the mud and water. So your line of people, you're running towards it, and when you get right about to this location, some people are going to go through the mud, and they have a larger distance of mud to go through. Some people have a very short distance of mud to go through. Well, your nice straight line isn't going to be nice and straight on the other side, because those that had to go through the longer section of mud are going to fall behind those that went through the short sections. So when you come out the other side, your people are going to be in a shape like this. Now, our people are an analogy for a wave. So here comes our wave into the glass. And what happens is it slows down when it goes into the glass. And the part in the middle slows down for a longer period of time than the part on the outer edges. So when that wave comes out, it doesn't come out straight, but it comes out curved. And once it comes out curved, it continues that curved movement and focuses down to a single point. So our lens works because the glass slows the light. And that combination of the slowing of a light and the variety of the thickness of the glass cause that light to come out and in this case focus down on the far side. Now if we now replaced our lens by a diverging shape because the shape we've been analyzing is a converging shape, imagine that to be your mud puddle and now your line of friends that are running at that really weird shaped mud puddle. When you get to that mud puddle, those that go through the thicker part, which now would be towards the outer edges, are going to lag behind those that went through the thinner part. So then coming out the other side, you're going to have people approximately in this shape. Now, if this is a wave, here comes our wave. That wave comes out the other side and the center leads the outer edges. As that wave then continues to travel, it spreads out looking like it had originally started from a single point on that side and that point would be called the focal point. So again, the why behind lenses working is a combination of their varying in thickness and the change in the speed of the light. Now, a little bit of terminology. Here I have converging lens and diverging lens. Principal axis, that's a line that's gonna go through the center of the lens. On that line, we're gonna identify several different points. F is your focal point. 2F is a distance of twice your focal point. So because the light can go through either side, we're going to have an F and 2F on each side. O at the center, that's just referred to as the optical center of the lens. And then for reference, we put a plane down the middle. In a simulation that you'll do, they will simulate specific rays that will travel. So I want to summarize a little bit about those rays. So I'm going to draw a converging lens shape. We know it's converging because it's thicker in the middle. I'm going to draw our principal axis. 
and I'm going to label our different points we saw on the previous slide. There are an infinite number of rays that come off of an object, usually by reflection unless it's producing light. So there are some rays that you have to use multiple calculations of Snell's law and some rays that are easy to predict where they go. And so I'm going to draw a light source and we can imagine an infinite number of rays coming off of that light source. Now we're going to follow a few particular rays. I'm going to take a ray drawing from the center of my object straight across parallel to the principal axis. But we saw in the demonstration that a ray that is parallel to the principal axis, it will refract. And when it does, it goes through a point that we define as the focal point. So that's an easy ray to draw. Realistically, there is a bend at each one of the surfaces. I'm going to simplify it to a single bend at the lens plane. For reference, we're going to call this a parallel ray. A second easy ray to draw is kind of reversing that logic. So I'm going to take another ray and I'm going to take it now initially through the focal point. The other ray started parallel and went through the focal point. This one went through the focal point and it will refract out parallel. So for reference, we're going to call this a focal ray or sometimes a principal focus ray. One more ray that is easy to draw. And that's a ray that will basically bend and then unbend. It bends as it goes in one side and it unbends as it goes out the other side. And that ray goes toward the optical center. It will bend as it goes in and unbend as it comes out the other side. And so for name reference, we would call that an optical ray. Now, notice those rays went through the lens, they refracted, and they all came together right to a single point over there. Well, that is the location where we would see the image of whatever our object was. That image forms where refracted rays intersect or appear to intersect. In this case, the rays actually intersect. And because they actually intersect, that would mean this is a real image because the light actually goes there. Remember with reflection, we talked about real images and virtual images. When the ray actually goes there, it is a real image. And this is something that could be projected onto a screen. A virtual image is an image formed where the rays do not actually pass. In the case of reflection, that was behind the mirror. We will see some virtual images also with lenses. Now let's talk about the math lens equations. First thing I need to do is identify some different measured quantities. So I have our principal axis, our five points, our lens, and an object and, and an image drawn here. We're about where they would form. Things that we measure. First of all, we need to locate the object. So the distance to the object is identified as d sub o, and all of our measurements are made from the lens plane. The focal length is measured from the lens plane out to the focal point, and for the lenses we'll be dealing with, it will be the same length on either side. Now we have to locate our image. If we go from the lens plane over to where the image is, that would be the image distance, and we would symbolize that with a d sub i. Now, we also need to know how big things are. And so from the principal axis to the top of our object, that would be the object height, h sub o. From the principal axis to the top of our image, that would be the image height, h sub i. So those are the different quantities that we measure. Now, mathematically, the relationships that relate these different quantities. Lens equation, 1 over f is equal to 1 over d sub i plus 1 over d sub o, or 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over the image distance plus 1 over the object distance. Second equation, h sub i divided by h sub o is equal to negative d sub i over d sub o, or hi ho equals di do. These are our two equations that mathematically describe what is going on with a lens. To be able to use these, 
We have things on different sides of the lens. We need to know what we call positive and what do we call negative. Here's a summary of the sign convention. Things that are positive, object distance is always positive. Image distance is positive for a real image. It's negative for a virtual image. Focal length is positive for a converging lens and negative for a diverging lens. Let me put it in a second context that will hopefully make a little bit more sense. Here we have our object and we have a lens. I don't have it drawn as a converging or a diverging lens, just as a generic word lens. And we have the lens plane. D sub O would be measured out to there and it's always going to be a positive value. Now everything else will be positive or negative based on where it is. So if I have light traveling to that lens and light goes through the lens to be able to form an image, if your image is over on the right side where the light goes, well, D sub I is going to be a positive value. If your image forms on the side of the lens where the light doesn't go, that D sub I value is going to be a negative. So if it was five centimeters, you would have to put in negative five centimeters. Diverging lenses will typically cause the light to spread out, seeming to spread out from a single point. So then the focal length for a diverging lens is a negative. A converging lens, converging lens tends to cause those rays together. So that focal length will be a positive. Now, in terms of object and image, things that are upright in the same orientation as your object, D sub I would be a positive value. Things that are upright would have an image height that is positive. They have the same orientation as the object. Things that are inverted would have an image height that is negative. So whichever way to think about it, it is easiest whether it's which side things are on or where light is going or back here. The key thing is when there is a negative, you need to put that negative in. And the two big negatives are when you have a virtual image, then that D sub I value is negative. And when you have a diverging lens, that focal length is negative. So that's the key thing to remember. D sub I negative virtual images, F is negative, for a diverging lens. Let's consider an example. We have a 12 centimeter tall object. So identifying what we have, nine centimeters in front of a lens and the focal length is six centimeters. So the first thing we need to do is identify what we know. If the object is 12 centimeters tall, that means H sub O is 12 centimeters. If it's placed nine centimeters in front of the lens, that's where the object is. So that means D sub O is nine centimeters. And then we have a focal length of six centimeters. On part A, we are dealing with finding the image distance and the height if our lens is a converging lens. Well, the fact that it is converging is very important because on our sign convention, that told us, told us that the focal length was a positive. So emphasizing that, positive six centimeters. Now we have two equations, our two lens equations. So with those equations, if I want to find, first of all, D sub I, and then we want to find H sub I, I can use the first equation to calculate D sub I. So that'll be one over six centimeters equals one over D sub I plus one over nine centimeters. To solve that down, we would subtract the one ninth to the other side and then solve the equation. So I'm gonna get our D sub I value is equal to 18 centimeters. The fact that it is positive D sub I means that it forms on the opposite side from the object. The second thing we're asked to calculate is the image height. So we're going to use the second equation. So if we plug our values in, that'll give me H sub I over 12 centimeters is equal to negative 18 centimeters divided by 9 centimeters. So if we solve that down, we're going to get an H sub I value equal to 
negative 24 centimeters. That negative on a height means that that image is inverted. Part B, now we're finding image distance and we're finding image height, but now our lens is a diverging lens. If it is a diverging lens, then our focal length will go in as a negative value. So our math is gonna be very similar to what we did above, except you have to put that negative in on the focal length. So that's one over negative six centimeters is equal to one over d sub i plus one over nine centimeters. So now when we subtract the one ninth to the other side, it will be negative one over six minus one over nine. Combine those together, invert those to find a d sub i value, and our d sub i value is negative 3.6 centimeters. That negative means that the image forms on the same side as the object. The second thing we need to find is the image height. So we'll use our second equation. So then plugging in values, this will be h sub i over 12 centimeters is equal to negative or the opposite of negative 3.6 centimeters divided by nine centimeters. When we solve down for h sub i, we're gonna get a positive 4.8 centimeters and that positive means that our image is upright. So key thing, make sure you identify what is given, list it by variable, and check for anything that should be plugged in as a negative value. Let's take a look at one more example. All year long, well, up to a few weeks ago, we've been using the projector that's mounted to the ceiling, and it has a system of lenses in it. We're gonna treat that system of lenses as a single converging lens, and it has been projecting an image onto the marker board in the front of the room. Let's analyze that lens system. Diagram below, you have the measurements because I've made the measurements in the room. The values you've got here, three centimeters. Well, that three centimeters, that's how big the bulb is, which is the object. So H sub O is three centimeters, eight centimeters. That's our distance from the lens out to the object. So that would be D sub O, 2.9 meters from the lens or the front of the projector over to the screen. The screen is where your image forms. So then the 2.9 meters would be D sub I. I'm gonna go ahead and convert that to centimeters. It doesn't matter whether you put everything in meters or everything in centimeters, as long as it's all in the same unit. So the first thing we wanna calculate is the focal length of the lens. So if we wanna calculate the focal length, we use our equation one over F equals one over D sub I plus one over D sub O. So it's gonna be one over F is equal to one over 290 centimeters plus one over eight centimeters. Doing the math to solve that down, one over 290 plus one over eight equals, get that decimal, and then one divided by that decimal. It's gonna give us a focal length equal to 7.79 .79 centimeters. Part B asks us to describe the image that is produced. I'm gonna describe it from the diagram that is here. If you think about the image that you see on that screen every day, well, that image, it is certainly larger, and I'm gonna write out part B right here, is certainly larger than the projector, so then that image must be enlarged in size. Second, it's actually forming on the screen, and if it's actually forming on the screen, that's where the light actually goes, and so then it will be a real image. Thirdly, it's upright, but the light passing through the lens, if you think about how the light went through, and this will become more evident when you do the investigation, the light is actually flipped over. So if we can zoom in on our object, notice there on the front of the object, our image or our object that is right there, that is the exact problem 
but the words are on the bottom and then the diagram is on the top. So from that orientation, it's the other way when it goes onto the screen. So that means that our image is inverted. So a real image that is enlarged and inverted. Part C, we want to calculate the magnification of the image. Let's think about magnification for a minute. When we want to know if something is magnified, we want to know if it's bigger or smaller. Well, that bigger or smaller would be bigger or smaller than the original object. So then when we're pondering magnification, we're comparing the image to the original object. It doesn't matter which measurement you, you compare as long as it's a corresponding measurement. So we could take the ratio of d sub i over d sub o, that's image to object. We could take the ratio of h sub i to h sub o. It doesn't matter, distances or heights, as long as we use the same thing. We know enough to be able to use that uh, distance ratio. So then d sub i, that was 290 centimeters. d sub o, that was 8 centimeters. And so when we divide that, we get 36.25. That means that the image is 36.25 times larger than the object. Let's think for a second about magnification values. If your object is not magnified, if it's the same size image and object, then you would divide and you would get a 1. So when a magnification is equal to 1, your image is the same size as your object. We just saw in this calculation, when your image is enlarged, then that magnification is going to be some value that is larger than 1. In this case, it was 36.25. If you have an image that is reduced in size, then you're going to have a image measurement smaller than the object measurement, which means your magnification would have to be a value less than 1. So magnification values, they're always going to be positive. Decimal, it's smaller. 1, it's the same size. Greater than 1, it is enlarged. And that was part C, not part B, because we did B on the previous screen. So now let's ponder D. The projector is turned to focus on a screen that is four meters away now. So we turn that, say, towards the back wall of the classroom, and we focus it on that wall. First part, how do you refocus to get a clear image? And then B, we want to calculate the distance between the lens and the bulb. Well, on the first part there, I want you to think if you've ever used or seen a more technical camera being used, camera that has a zoom lens on it or a telephoto lens, as you point that lens towards different objects at different distances, that lens has to physically move out of the body of the camera or in to the body of the camera. So that distance between the lens and where that film or the the digital receptors are located, you're changing that distance. Well, same thing is going to occur here, but in reverse, you're going to have to adjust this distance right here. So that lens is going to have to be moved, and that's what you do when you refocus things. You change the distance there between the lens and the object. So in part B, we're calculating the distance between the lens and the bulb, which is the object, to be able to refocus at the screen that's four meters away. So that screen being four meters away, that is a new d sub i value. So in terms of what we can use to calculate here, we have not changed the lens. So our focal length is still 7.79 centimeters. Our new d sub i value is 4 meters or 400 centimeters. And we want to calculate d sub o. Well, that's going to be our equation 1 over f 
equals 1 over d sub i plus 1 over d sub o, and plug in the values. When we solve down, we get a d sub o value equal to 7.94 centimeters, which means before it was at 8 centimeters, we move that lens just a little bit closer to the object, and in moving it closer, it pushed that image out farther. There are two things you're going to do from here. There's a problem assignment applying the lens equations, and there is an investigation where you're going to go through the rays and set up different object locations, see how the rays go to form the images, and describe those images.